right, well, let's get started. Welcome everyone um, to our Spring Chosen Forum. My name is Susan Huang. I'm a neonatologist at the Anschutz Medical Campus and Associate Professor of Pediatrics here at the School of Medicine and one of the steering committee members for Chosen Quick. I'm so thankful that you are all joining us this morning. It would be nearly impossible for us to do introductions individually. Um, and so please do uh, use the chat to share your name, any roles or perspectives you hold, and any organizations with which you are affiliated. So we'll give folks a minute or two to enter that in. This is great. Lots of friends and colleagues that I see popping up. All right. And while you all continue to do that, I'm going to hand it over to Cassie to do a tech check. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think most of us are probably familiar with uh, the basics of Zoom and other uh, video conferencing platforms at this point, but I always find it's helpful just in case to do a quick tech check. So you'll see there on your screen um, sort of all of the main elements that may be useful to you today. So looking here at the bottom of your screen, uh, you should have a toolbar in the bottom left corner where you see a mute or unmute. So um, during some of the presentations, we'll have question and answer periods where we'll invite you to either share um, in the chat or to, to unmute and share um, and share a question that you may have. Um, next to the mute button, you'll have where you can stop or start your video um, that if you uh, welcome to do what you need to do throughout the day, we'd love to see faces on screen um, as we're all gathered here together and presenting, but we also want to make sure um, that you can do what you need to do. Um, so feel free to have your video on or off throughout the day. Um, if you would like to um, raise your hand at any point to share a question, um, you can do so by clicking that participants button um, and then you should find your name in the list and um, you should have a, an option to raise your hand next to that, or you can also use, um, not shown here, but you should have a reactions button um, in your toolbar as well, where you can also use to find to raise your hand. Um, the share content, um, that should mostly be for our speakers today. Most participants shouldn't be needing that, um, so we can kind of skip right over that. Um, your chat panel, most of you are already using that, so uh, that's something else you'll find on the toolbar, so uh, you'll see a little red uh, notifications pop up as people are sharing, so you can click that to open it, um, see what folks are saying, as well as contribute yourself. Um, and uh, we hope you won't need this until the very end, but there's your leave meeting button as well. Um, to the side here is where you'll see what I had been mentioning around, uh, you should have reactions in that toolbar. If you don't see it, you might need to click the three little dots with the more to find it. You can use that to raise your hand or to otherwise um, react to our presentations today. Um, and then at the top of the screen here, you'll just see um, your options to toggle between speaker view and gallery view. So at the top right of your screen, you should have that option. So um, you can kind of go back and forth between those um, as you wish. Um, and throughout, if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to, to send a private message to myself um, if you're having any tech issues um, and I can try to help troubleshoot. All right. And one of the best parts of the Chosen Forum you get free snacks. So we can't meet in person and can't feed you, but if you registered, hopefully by now, you have redeemed your snack pass. And Cassie was uh, wise enough to uh, bring to my awareness that I didn't get my snack pass last year. And so when I logged in with the same email account, that credit was still there. So I was then able to get $60 worth of snacks for this year. So really do uh, get your snacks. I was, I've been told that they're very high quality and quite tasty. All right, one last um, icebreaker activity. We'd like to know where you're joining from today. So please scan the QR code that you see shown or click the link that'll pop up in the chat. And then you can add a pen to the map. You can put in your specific address. If you wanna be very public and put in your home address, you can. It could be your work address or just your zip code. And then click publish. And Cassie will then show us the map of our state so we can see where you all are coming from.
Is there someone really from California? Oh my God. Ooh. Got Colorado, some Wyoming. Shout out to the one pin on the Western Slope. I see one just popped up up in Vermont. Oh, I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Elena in Vermont. <laughs> Hi, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are just hugging that I-25 corridor for dealer in life. All right. This is fantastic. Thanks, everyone. I think this this uh, not only demonstrates where we're all from, but where we need to expand. We clearly are on that I-25 corridor, uh, despite years and years of work of, of trying to reach our, our more rural partners. But thank you so much for um, putting that down. All right, let's get started. We have a fantastic morning and early afternoon set for you today. And while I won't read through each item of the agenda, I do want to highlight that the focus of, of today is really on transitions, is how do we meet um, our families where they're at during or as early as possible in pregnancy, and how can we optimize that transition home from, um, from the birth hospitalization. So really the theme today is around transitions. Next slide. And before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the incredible pressure and trauma many of us are experiencing at this time. Racism continues to overwhelm our communities. The COVID pandemic feels relentless and it feels as though our institutions at times are failing us as we can't even feed our infants given the formula shortage and overdose deaths continue to climb. Despite all of this, and perhaps because of all of this, we are here together to listen and learn from each other because we refuse to accept that this is some new normal. I know all, all of you could have spent these hours completing the endless lists, list of professional or personal tasks that we all have. And yet we're here as a multidisciplinary committee, a community committed to supporting our families experiencing substance use. So thank you for your compassion and commitment. Next slide. And so as we always do, I'd like to set the stage of uh, where we are in our country and in our state of Colorado with respect to substance use. This is data from the National Vita Statistics System from the CDC showing rapidly rising rates of drug overdose deaths in the US from 2015 to present. You can see that we have the steepest rise during the COVID pandemic and we are expected to hit um, 100,000 deaths in 2021, 2022 annually. Next slide. From the same data source, we see the percent change in overdose deaths from December 2020 to December 2021. And this is shown by state. The darker the shade of orange, the higher the increase. In Colorado, we had 1,477 individuals who died from drug overdoses in 2020, and that was the most ever recorded in our state. For comparison, this is one and a half times the number of Coloradans who died from a heart attack in 2020. Next slide. Next slide. I think my internet connection here on campus is a bit unstable. I am looking for slide five. So rural urban differences in drug overdose. And I, I'd like to highlight that while we see these national estimates, we know that there are regional differences in urban rural differences in, in drug overdose. This is, if you wanna go back uh, three more slides, Cassie. Back, now we're going forward. Sorry, thanks for your patience. I'm getting, let's see. No worries. 
Let me stop and reshare. Yeah, we're in this slide, urban rural differences in drug overdose. And Cassie, I can also share my slides if that is helpful. Oh, perfect. All right. So I wanted to highlight that there are certainly regional differences in the drug overdose deaths. And this is data from um, the National Center for Health Statistics for 1999 to 2019. Next slide. So shown here are overdose death rates stratified by rural urban residents. Um, and you can see that for both areas, the, the increase has been steep the rate of rise, very rapid. Over the last five years, we have seen that urban overdose death rates um, have exceeded that of those in rural communities. Next slide. However, there are state variations. And so shown here color-coded are um, by state, whether or not a rural or urban area in that state had higher overdose de deaths. And so in green, it's when the rural rate is higher, blue if urban rate is higher, the gray is no significant difference. And so while Colorado is shown to be gray, meaning there's not a statistically significant difference in rural urban death rates, when stratified even further um, by cause of death, we do see differences. Next slide. And so here we see age adjusted rates of opioid involved drug overdose deaths by type of opioid, stratified again by urban or rural residents. And this is where you start to see the differences um, really get teased apart, where you can see in the dark blue overdose deaths due to synthetic opioids in urban settings, and this is mainly fentanyl. Compare that to in, in the rural areas in green, also we have synthetic opioids, fentanyl, but to a lesser magnitude. And then you can also see the differences in deaths due to heroin in the rural and urban regions. Next slide. I know many of us have been very concerned about not only opioid use disorders, but also other stimulants and um, substances such as methamphetamines. So here we see overdose deaths due to stimulant involved um, drugs, again, stratified by rural urban status. And so you can see that for the, the the rural, you can see that deaths due to psychostimulants, mainly methamphetamine, far exceeds those um, that are in the urban areas. And shown also here are deaths due to cocaine, which are higher in the urban areas. And I show these slides really to highlight some of the struggles that we here in Colorado are acutely aware of, that a one-size-fits-all approach to um, assisting families with substance use is, is really not going to work. There are significant differences in our communities by substance type, but also the whole bevy of social factors that have led to um, these individual struggles with substance use. Next slide. Now, if we were to focus on the maternal infant population, here we see results from a cross-sectional analysis of 2010 to 2017 inpatient data. Now, in, in A, you can see that these are NAS rates um, per 1,000 birth hospitalizations. You can see that Colorado is a relatively pale color, which shows that the rates are relatively quote unquote low relative to the country, other states. But look at B, this is the percent change and NAS rates um, during that time period. And our color scheme is becoming much darker. Shown in C, our uh, maternal opioid use-related diagnoses, again by state, Colorado looking somewhat pale. And then in D, it's the change, the percent change in maternal opioid use-related diagnoses during birth hospitalization. And we are one of the darkest colors, such that for NAS in 2010, we had a rate of 2.4 per 1,000 birth hospitalizations. Then in 2017, it was 6.2, so an increase of 160%. For maternal opioid use disorders, in 2010, our rate was 1.4 per 1,000 birth hospitalizations, jumped to 6.8 in 2017, which is a 385% increase, one of the largest increases in the country. Next slide. Now, the CDC and many other public health organizations are, are honing in on this really big issue. Now, and it's not just 
suicidal health level. This is a framework that the CDC has put out um, to highlight how they are focusing on preventing overdoses and substance use related harms. Now they've taken this framework and have applied it also to the, to the population that are reproductive age. And so if you go onto their website, you can see all of these things that are really focused on the perinatal health population. Now I show this to you to highlight that we at Chosen are trying to do very much the same things, that this is our goal and we are working towards towards these things, that our guiding principles are to promote health equity, address the underlying factors, those social determinants of health. We need to partner broadly, take evidence-based approaches, and advance our science and be innovative in, in what it is that we're proposing. And our strategic priorities are very much in line with what you will hear this morning, that we are focused on data, monitoring, analyzing trends, that we need to increase capacity to do this work across our states, that we need to support our providers um, who are really at the front lines. And we need to partner broadly with not just healthcare organizations, but our community partners and our advocacy nonprofit partners as well. And so we have chosen, while we do better, I think in some of these domains than others, we can't just focus on one and it's really being multidisciplinary and collaborative um, in our approach that will lead to any modicum of success. Next slide. Now, we are focused on caring for others, but it is so important to also focus on how we can take care of ourselves. Just yesterday, the US Surgeon General, Dr. Murthy, released this advisory on addressing health worker burnout. Now, the Biden administration is calling for new investments and steps to protect the mental well being of health workers. And as quoted in US News, Dr. Murthy says, unless changes are made, this country will be less prepared for future, for future public health emergencies, and we will send a message to millions of healthcare workers that their suffering does not matter. Next slide. And so this is um, his conclusion to the advisory. Um, that was published. And I'd just like to share the first two paragraphs. You know, before the advisory was released, Dr. Murthy is um, visiting his Jackson Memorial Hospital, his hometown in Miami, Florida. He's going around and asking the group about how they were coping with the pandemic. And there's one particular nurse who says that he is helpless, but not hopeless. And then Dr. Murthy then says, I was struck by his faith. After two unfathomably, unfathomably traumatic years, he was still showing up, sometimes tired, sometimes overwhelmed, sometimes scared or lonely, but always confident in the power of his compassion, his colleagues and his community to make things just a little bit better every day. And in so many ways, um, in preparing for this forum, I felt these words to be true with all of you who show up to these forums every six months, despite everything that you all are going through. And so I do want to highlight, it is critically important that we also take care of ourselves as we learn to take care of others. Next slide. And so as we start this day, um, we, as we always do, root what we do in the lived experiences um, of the mothers and families that we serve. And so we're going to hear a story of an individual with a lived experience related to substance use and pregnancy and parenting. We'll be hearing the story from Tough as a Mother. And in case you all haven't heard of Tough as a Mother, please, please go onto their website and, and really spend several hours looking through it. It is rich with resources. And so Tough as a Mother is a public awareness campaign that helps to connect Colorado mothers with dependent children to substance use treatment providers in their communities. And so the first story that we're gonna be hearing this morning is from Dominique in Colorado Springs. Dominique. I am from Colorado Springs and I'm a mother in recovery. So the moment I realized I needed help would have had to been, it was about um, five or six months after I gave birth to my third child. My third child was born eight weeks early due to my substance use disorder. And, you know, I've been incarcerated. I've been homeless. Um, I had another child um, that was in the foster care system that my rights were terminated on. Um, 
and by that third child, you know, I just kept going, right? And drugs and alcohol no longer worked for me. Um, I got to a point of complete hopelessness where I, I wanted to die. Um, in November of 2017, I would have to say that that was my moment of surrender. I remember dropping to my knees in the, in the middle of a, a complete annihilation of myself. I had so many substances in my system, so much chaos going on, so much darkness in my life that I remember saying, God, if you're real and if you are there, I need you to do something because I can't die. My kids are taken away from me. <clears throat> I can't stay sober. Like, what is it that you want for me? And um, on January 3rd of 2018, I was arrested for my last time and uh, I got some clarity. You know, I, I, I was incarcerated for four months and, and I had some time to really, really reflect on, on what it is that I needed to change in my life and, and how that was going to happen. Been the biggest change since starting my journey. Um, everything has changed. <laughs> There's been so many changes. Um, the biggest change is that I get to show up as a mother today. Today, I get to show up as a sober, present mother. I get to be active in, in my kid's life. Um, today, I get to show up as a, as a sister, as a daughter, as a friend, as a worker. Um, and I'm no longer uncomfortable in my own skin. Today, I can live um, in my own skin, skin authentically. Uh, today, I get to show up. Um, and another huge change for me is today, I get to live day by day without the obsession of wanting to put drugs and alcohol in my system. And that's nothing short of a miracle. The biggest thing I could share with the community and to loved ones about loving somebody that has substance use disorder is that no matter what, keep the conversations open. Don't be judgmental. Don't be shameful. Um, my experience was the first time I told my family that I thought I had a problem, they didn't want to believe it. Um, we were all in denial and, and I don't place blame or anything on them. But I think that the conversation um, is so rigid for some people that they don't want to talk about it. They just kind of want to dismiss it. As a community, we need to continue to talk about these things. We need to continue to understand that this is this is real life, like this is impacting um, our communities today. Um, we have to remain open to conversations with individuals who are struggling. We have to be available to those individuals when they are ready to reach out for help. Um, people can and do recover. They recover every single day. I work in an agency today where I see so many faces of hope. I see so many faces and voices of recovery. People can and do recover. And as long as we aren't shameful, judgmental, and unkind to one another, and we're, we remain open to those conversations and open to the possibility that somebody can live a purposeful life without drugs and alcohol, we're on the right track. My name is Dominique and I'm tough as a mother. I am moved every time I, I hear Dominique's testimony. I thank her so much for sharing her story.